Hey everyone, welcome to session 75 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by the ACT Bootcamp for Behavior Analyst Workshop that's taking place in Reno, Nevada on March 7th through 10th. There'll be 32 credit hours available and you will learn from notable uh, people in the uh, ACT and RFT world such as Steve Hayes, Evelyn Gould, Mark Dixon, and David Sloan Wilson. So if that's something you're interested in, you're going to want to go to the show notes for today's episode where there will be links to this event as well as a promo code good for $50 off your registration. Today's episode is also sponsored by Behavior University. Behavior University's mission is to provide university-level continuing education to practitioners, and uh, they also have a great um, RBT program as well. So you're going to want to go to behavioral universe. Excuse me, I was going to say behavioralobservations.com. Let me try that again. Behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations, and there you will find a 10% coupon code for everything on their website. And so we'll hear a little bit more from Behavior University in a bit, but. Let's get to today's guest. Today's guest is a a returning guest. Uh, I am happy to be talking with Dr. Matt Broadhead of Michigan State University, and we're just going to have a more casual conversation and take a deeper dive into the realm of ethics. His book is out right now, and uh, so he's been traveling the country, speaking at conferences, and getting lots of feedback on it. So I've asked Matt to come back on and share lessons learned in that process. So uh, it's a, another fun conversation with Matt, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did uh, having it. So without any further ado, let's hear more from Dr. Matt Broadhead. <laughs> Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. All right, everyone, you are listening to Matt Broadhead's mother's favorite podcast, the Behavioral Observations Podcast. Welcome back for round number two, Dr. Matt Broadhead. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Matt. Um, thanks for having me back. And, and just, you know, for listeners, for some context there, um, my, my mother really loves this, this podcast and often informs me about matters related in my field and, and might know more about what's going on than I do at times due to uh, the podcast. So I want to give a shout out to her. Um, and, and thanks, Matt, for her, the shout out to her as well. And thanks for having me on. All right. Yes. The, yes. The big shout out to the coolest mom in the world. Uh, and, uh, and, and who has, who has exquisite taste, I might, I might add. Uh, and, and she's done a fine job uh, rearing a, a, a very nice young man. So, um, Matt, it's, uh, it's great to have you back again. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to have you back, Matt, is that, that uh, I see that you've been making the rounds. I think that when we talked last spring, I think it was last spring when the podcast went out, your book um, hadn't been published yet. Uh, but we were, it was about to be released. I think it was all all but done, but the right. final edits. Right. Uh, and so I wanted to have you back uh, since it's been out and since you've been on kind of the, the speaking circuit and get some of the feedback that you've received uh, as, as an author being out, you know, um, speaking at conferences, interacting with behavior analysts, you know, um, I think one of the things that I see a lot, uh, you know, following you on Twitter and, you know, you and I, for people who, you know, follow uh, either one of us on Twitter. We, we, we tend to converse a lot in that way. And, you know, I've noticed in the last year or two, you've been uh, traveling quite a bit. You just spoke at the autism, the, the ABAI autism conference. Uh, You um, in person went up to Burlington, Vermont and spoke to the Vermont uh, association for behavior analysis, which I was really bummed. I couldn't make it up there. It's not too bad of a drive. Um, but you got to visit one of the most uh, beautiful cities in the Northeast. Um, next time, try to make it in the summer. It's much fun. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or bring your skis. Um, sure. And then uh, just last week, you uh, uh, phoned one in, if you will. Uh, not, 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 
pejorative way, of course, but uh, you uh, joined us, the uh, New Hampshire Association for Behavior Analysis, our uh, annual meeting you uh, presented there on scope of practice. And I know you've been to other conferences, Alaba and things like that. So you um, being a, a kind of a, uh, a commodity of sorts on, on, on the conference uh, circuit, and again, um, having that opportunity to interact with so many people asking questions about ethics and things like that. Again, I want to have you back and uh, I guess take a deeper cut into the work that you've done. So I guess that's the context, if you will, of, of round number two. Great. Wonderful. So I guess the first question I have is, since you have been out and about, as I just kind of explained in a very long-winded way, you must be getting feedback from folks. What is the what are some common themes you're seeing out there amongst the, the practitioners in the trenches as far as day-to-day ethical challenges are concerned? Yeah, yeah. So great question. I think, um, and you know, one of the things about I think one of the best parts about the job is being able to have the opportunity to go speak and and talk with so many people at the at the, at the state chapters and um, meet the people who are making the real meaningful differences in those areas um, uh, in the states that they're practicing in, and uh, to be able to share the message and and share the story uh, that that I'm trying to tell and that my my collaborators and I are trying to tell together. I think you know one of the the um, you know, the most common reoccurring themes, and, and this is not a knock on any anybody else in any particular sense, but just more so, I think that people are really excited to have um, just additional material and additional perspective on on ethics and, and behavior analysis. And that that is a, a very encouraging thing to me. Um, you know, still, I think, being rather young, um, there's, there's still, I think, credibility I'm trying to build about for myself and my work and to have people say that they really appreciate what I'm saying and how we're saying it um, is really, you know, those are some very powerful reinforcers for me that um, really in- in- encourage the type of work that uh, that I do, that I do with, with my co-authors. So, um, you know, just as an example, I had, um, uh, after I gave my talk at the autism conference, uh, I got an email from a young man who had told me that he had bought the book and read it uh, cover to cover that evening. And, you know, we were in San Francisco. That city's incredible. And, and though there's a lot of great speakers with a lot of great material, um, you know, there's a lot of competing contingencies Um uh, against like reading my book, but that's what he chose to do after the talk. And, and that really struck me and was a really um, encouraging and empowering um, uh, note. And it gives me um, good hope that that we're at least, you know, somewhere on, on track with, with what we're trying to do. So obviously you struck a chord with that individual and um, I'm sure there are others who have found your book very helpful. Um, what what are some of the uh, in in the correspondence that you get from from readers? What what are some of the common themes that they've found um, that they are faced with on a day to day basis in terms of those those quandaries that we find ourselves in from time to time and and. Um, yeah, so I guess let's just kind of start with you know. Obviously, it's cool that this guy got the book and, and read it uh, while while. Uh, putting on hold all those other abundant reinforcers in, in that city. Um, uh, what are, what are, what are some of the things that, uh, that are, that are resonating specifically in terms of, uh, specific topics, possible solutions, et cetera? I think, I think it's the, um, first off, I've got a lot of really good feedback about the, just the analytical process that, um, we tried to demonstrate throughout the book, um, where we weave the code in and out of these complex issues that we've chosen to demonstrate that, um, it's, it's a lot more complex and there's a lot more gray than, than, um, what might be perceived, uh, to be the case. I think in terms of particular content, uh, one of the recurring bits of feedback that I've gotten is that our second chapter in particular about, um, uh, choice and um, uh, behavioral research on choice and how that might inform how we might make ethical decisions or decisions around ethical dilemmas and so forth has been quite informative. I think people have really liked that that translation. Um, that was uh, 
you know, really to give credit, David Cox wrote that chapter because he, he, uh, he's very skilled in that area and he's doing his postdoc right now. Um, Johns Hopkins, and, and he's, he's very heavily involved in, in choice research. So David took that content and really made it accessible uh, f- for our readers. And, and I think that's opened a lot of doors there for a lot of people and has really um, made um, quite an impact. So, so not, not to spoil that chapter, but can you give us kind of a, a flavor of, of, of the idea of choice uh, f- framing up how we, you know, we make these decisions in our day to day as it relates to that, you know, what, what was, how that was framed up in the book? Yeah, yeah. No, great. No, happily. And and Dave, if David's listening at all or any choice researchers, I apologize. I'm not trying to butcher butcher it. Um, but you, you know, yelling at their phone. No, you did. No, no, I was just kidding. No. Um, but, you know, you think about behavior. Occur, all behavior occurs in a choice context. We have an option to engage in, in, in at least, you know, two behaviors. Um, I don't think that there's ever a single awkward situation, um, like just a lever. Right. <laughs> there's there's there are at least two levers in our in our lives at, at any given point that we could press. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that talks about is the, the associated effort associated with each choice, uh, the delay to the outcomes, the magnitude of the reinforcers associated with the outcomes and and the. Um, the amount of information that we have uh, prior to our ability to make a choice and um, also the length of time that we have until we have to make a choice and how all of those are are contextual factors that uh, can affect our ability to make optimal choices. Are you in need of continuing education? Well, Behavior University is a BACB approved continuing ed provider and their mission is to provide university quality courses and ABA for new and experienced professionals alike. Their live webinars generally have a limited number of attendees so that the learning experience is highly interactive. And if you can't make the live events, these webinars are recorded and available in Behavior University's CEU library for later viewing. Behavior University also has a 40-hour RBT training. This self-paced course uses a combination of visual presentation, audio lectures, and live video models to teach all areas of the RBT task list. The course is accessible anytime and from anywhere. So if you'd like to learn more, head on over to behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations, where you'll find a 10% discount for podcast listeners. Again, that's behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations. And thanks for checking them out. One of the things you, I, I saw that you were doing also, and I know you can't spoil it too much, but uh, I know that um, you're in the process of, of writing up some case studies for publication in terms right. of uh, identifying ethical dilemmas uh, and providing, I guess, uh, ways to navigate them. I was going to say solutions, but sometimes they, you know, that's, it's sometimes you have to put solutions in air quotes. It's like the okay, what's the least bad of these two these two choices right. or whatever? But um, so I. I guess my first question is, if you can't, uh, if you're not at liberty to kind of speak to the details of this case study, what, talk about the process of how would, you know, would, how you'd write, how you plan to write up this, you know, cause obviously, or, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of going through, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, in my head, what, a, what, a, what a typical table of contents in like Java might be, or, you know, behavior right. analysis and practice and, and, you know, um, I, I, I'm I'm blanking at seeing something like this before, although they're quite quite uh, may, may could have been, but I, it sounds like a pretty. No, I guess where I'm rambling towards, it sounds like it's a pretty novel uh, paper to put out there. Uh, so I, I guess at first, just if you can talk about the process of what you're trying to accomplish with this and um, how you set it up, that would be a good place to start. Yeah. So. Um... And, and you're absolutely right in that that conveying it has been has been somewhat difficult because it, it is out of the ordinary of the other types of things that I have written. But I think the f- the framework that I'm using so it, it it kind of does go back to the book in a sense. Um, in chapter three of that book, we talk about a behavioral systems approach to ethics training and supervision, where I outline uh, the steps of behavioral systems analysis and how they can be applied to um, teaching people to behave ethically and creating systems of supervision with regard to ethics and so forth. So the, the write-up of the case study 
takes that same structure and sense where it outlines a process through behavioral systems analysis to create a, a particular outcome. So the the details of it all are are still um, you know will remain confidential part of part of what the deal is between me and the individuals that they would see the final product before the full information would be put out we have an agreement but um it just as a as a redundancy that nothing uh, that they're not comfortable with ever gets out but to give you a bit of information uh, it involves uh remediation um so uh, uh sanctions put forth by um the BACB um might require certain types of uh you to take certain types of actions to be able to remedy um, violations that you might have been um, uh, found to, um, you know, uh, um, have you know, caused, excuse me, or, or committed. So what it does is it outlines a supervisory process for how to take somebody through and, and create a product to, to where there's capacity for them to continue and, and carry out in a better in a way that is better and improved than before but also it's there to provide a framework for other people who fall into the situation where they might be in a, you know providing supervision to somebody through a remediating process and need help and guidance and support and how to do that so it's sort of a twofold thing i want to i want to try to put the conceptual process that we um, talked about to use in the book. But I also want to provide a framework for other people who end up in my situation because I think um, that I'm not going to be the only person uh, who's going to be faced with this challenge. And there weren't really resources for me to do it. But I anticipate that, you know, the paper would be resources for a resource for others who do have to go through that process. I see. And I think we chatted about this the last time, the, the, the actual literature on ethics and, uh, I guess to a, you know, a similar extent supervision in our, our field, you know, is dwarfed by all the other stuff that, you know, frankly is a lot more fun to talk about. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, so, so it's, it's cool to have a, a, a different way, uh, to, to share information with day-to-day -day practitioners about how they can, um, use some of these, uh, analytic tools that you that you've described so right. and, and you know what I'm, and I'm trying to get more towards um, empirical research on this topic I think that I've, I've had a really great time writing the conceptual discussion papers and I'm I'll, I don't plan on stopping that per se but but there's um, I I feel my find myself just wanting more of, and I'm not quite sure what that more is but I I think it might be this empirical you know more empirical approach the um the case study is a step in that direction um it's not it's not a full on like you know java quality experimental manipulation um but I'm okay with that because there's not anything at all that exists so it's about you know getting to a point um and not making that jump from A to Z all the way. It's, it's about, you know, you know, slowly getting there, I think. Um, but, but also we're working on some David Cox and Sean Quigley and I are working on some additional empirical studies on this topic that we uh, hope to hope to be sharing soon that, that start to at least provide frameworks or ideas for other people to work on this stuff in an empirical manner. Um, so we can move beyond the discussion papers, which I think are great uh, to, uh, you know, the empirical evaluations, I think, more align with uh, what our values are as behavior analysts, too. Are you, uh, are you at, you know, not, not to make this the cryptic show, but, you know, are you at liberty to talk about, like, the sources of data that, that you guys, um, ha, ha, you know, I'm just trying to think, you know, if, if, you know, what the dependent variable, you know, when you start, when you start talking sure. about kind of some sort of experimental design here, you know, I, my mind immediately goes to, okay, well, what is being measured? What is being, you know, changed? Uh, you know, what is, you know, it, um, the nature of how you would go about doing that? Because I have to imagine the source of data has to be uh, possibly messy, if you will. It's not nearly as, right. as, as nice as we would like as, as behavior analysts. And I'm just trying to think, okay, what is that information that you would get from the board in terms of like, you know, the, 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 
um, the number of violations in particular categories or, you know, stuff from large organizations that are, you know, uh, overseeing lots of practitioners. And, you know, can you talk a little bit about how, how that works? Yeah, I th- we're gonna we're gonna go uh, to the um, I guess the masses, so to speak. There's, we're working on some survey tools that are going to help give us a a starting point to begin to look more closely at specific things. But it, you know, it's all very exploratory in nature. I think where where we're at with our with our empirical research and ethics and behavior analysis. So I think a survey is is a really good place to start to sort of just like get some ballpark ideas about some common issues or, or variables that might um, be cause for additional evaluation um, and more, you know, like um, controlled evaluations down the line. So that's that's our starting our, our starting point with that, at least. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So getting so, so I'm, I'm I I think I my my mind went a few steps ahead, perhaps, and perhaps this this kind of exploratory survey research might start the process of delineating what some good experimental questions might be later on. So um, yeah, and and you know what, Matt, it's it, it's it was hard for me to kind of come to grips with that, but I think that um, you know as a behavior analyst trained. Uh, you know, in my graduate programs, that wasn't something that we did, but I've noticed that my colleagues all here at Michigan state who have been very successful have taken that approach with their work and it's, and, um, have gradually gotten to those really like fine tuned experimental manipulations uh, by taking those initial exploratory measures. So, um, what better way than to, you know, follow in the frameworks of people who have been successful and, and to adopt some of those strategies and for your own use. Yeah, and you know, and it's not without precedent in our right. field. Certainly, uh, right. you know, one of the some of the two most, I guess, memorable from my perspective, survey uh, data sets that I've come across in Java were those ones. I think in the, uh, I think it was in 2015 where they surveyed the use of functional assessment amongst practitioners, and it was it was pretty sad. <laughs> and it wasn't one study; right. it was two studies that that basically found the same results. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I do know what you're talking about. You know, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> uh, but you know, good, good for those authors for using those tools. Cause how else we would have known that, you know? Um, and so we can bemoan self-report and whatnot, but you know, even if it's somewhat accurate, it's, it's still highlighting an issue that, that needs, that warrants discussion in our field. So, um, I agree. We should, we shouldn't, uh, we should look at these different method, research methodologies as, as, as tools. Uh, and you have to select the right tool for the job. Right. No, you're absolutely. And, and a lot of these methodologies that we might traditionally shun are well accepted in, in other fields that have done very well for themselves. And so it's, it's a, it's a, it's a balance, right? Staying true to this, this behavior analytic tradition that I was raised in while being open to embrace the other uh, methods and, and strategies that others have used. Um, now I, I get you there for sure. Yeah. Um, so I, we we talked about talking about scope of practice and scope of competence and things like that. And I think we spent a little bit of time on that the last time we chatted. Um, I want to get to that in a minute, but do you, uh, um, is that something that practitioners are talking to you about, you know, as you're, as you're, you know, making the rounds, uh, um, you know, I, I have to imagine like, People, do, do people, let me just ask this because uh, I'm making an assumption here. So let me just clarify whether this is true or not. But, um, you know, if you're at a conference and, you know, maybe you're kind of socializing, you know, uh, at the, uh, you know, at, uh, while, while getting a coffee or, or, or whatever, um, as the ethics guy, if you will, or the, 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 you know, do people come up to you and, and kind of say, hey, you know what? I've seen this or I've seen that, you know, like do, do people share or perhaps sometimes overshare or whatever, you know, kind of stories of, of, uh, behavior analysts acting badly or, or organizations, you know, making decisions that are, that are, you know, suspect from a, from an ethical standpoint. Yeah, I, I do get a lot of, a lot of that just in general and, and not related to those two particular, um, you know, topics, I guess, scope of practice and scope of competence, but the, 
I get a lot of questions and it's, um, yeah, I guess a couple of comments on that. I think first is one thing that has been clear to me is that people are really just seem to be interested and want to do the right thing. And, and I'm really glad that they're asking questions. And I also feel like there aren't a lot of resources for them or experts for them to reach out to that they're able to have their questions answered. And so I, it, it, I'm not really surprised, you know, like, oh, hey, you're somebody who's talking about this stuff, you know, let me ask these questions. The, uh, the challenge that I'm facing, and, and I don't know, um, I'd be curious about, you know, thoughts on this, or, or maybe I'm too conservative in this regard, is that I've always been really hesitant about giving specific advice or, uh, telling people to do X, Y, and Z, unless, unless the answer is really obvious, it's maybe a, like a legal thing, but I, I, I don't really know if I've happened upon any of those issues, um, mainly because I've been really worried about liability um, associated with that, uh, the, you know, that kind of thing. I know that some in the field have chosen to uh, provide advice and opinion um, based off of, um, you know, information that they have about ethical issues, but I've been been pretty worried about giving the wrong advice to somebody and then, and then being liable for that later. And so what I think I at least try to do I guess always is encourage people to reach out to people who they trust, who understand the context really well, uh, to seek legal counsel, um, or to, um, you know, maybe some combination to try to work the situations out. So I think, I think really kind of how it comes down is to, is to empower them. A, A, your situation is hard and I hear you and B, you can solve this. And, and, and these would be the people that you should contact or work with to, to solve it versus telling them my opinion, X, Y, Z, because again, I may not have all the information to be able to make the right call on it. And, and then two, I'm, I'm, I'm just worried about, you know, giving bad advice and having it um, not be favorable for the, in terms of the liability part later. Yeah, especially yeah. if some harm came to a client uh, because someone yeah, misconstrued what you were saying or you didn't have the full picture and we're shooting from the hip and things like that. And I think that's the idea of, of, of these kind of analytical frameworks. Right. Uh, are, are helpful. So, you know, you might, right. you know, be able to describe a process for determining for people to kind of self-study, if you will. Right. And, and, you know, one of the, and one of the things, the major problems and that I see is people giving advice without enough information. Um, and I think we talked a little bit about this in, in the book in chapter seven, but I, I see it a lot online. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. It's like, we could all talk about all the, all the bad, you know, the weird things we see on social media, just in general, like the, not even related to behavior analysis, but, but I, I see a lot of that. And I, you know, at least when I talk to my students and we have conversations about this, it's, you know, it, it, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of before you start to guide somebody through something like this, you have got to understand everything that's happening. And, and without without that, uh, that analytical process and, and information gathering, you know, you are you're not being helpful <laughs> in, in a lot of cases. And I I wish, you know, my my call for people would be to um, tr try to use the same level of analysis that they use for ethics that they do for everything else about human human behavior. Um, there's there's really no reason why you can't, you know, it seems like those core values of being analytical have a tendency to be abandoned when we're talking about ethical issues, um, but um, it, it need not be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um... All right, so let's um, let's tr turn to scope of competence and scope of practice. Um, so, I've got a couple questions here from uh, from listeners, and um, most of the questions have come from former guests, oddly enough. But uh, <laughs> um, real quick before we get into those, however, uh, for those who might be unfamiliar with your work, who or who didn't catch your first go around on the podcast. Uh, can you run us quickly through the difference between scope of practice and scope of competence? Yeah, for sure. And these are, these are tough terms that are often confused with one another. And I admit I did the same until the reviewers thoughtfully, um, 
pointed out that that they're completely separate and distinct but um so if you confuse these it's i'm right there with you uh, but hopefully with this distinction we can we can get it clarified so scope of confidence scope of practice, excuse me, scope of practice being um, the behaviors or activities in which you can engage by virtue of holding a credential or license. So I have my BCBA credential, um, there are certain things that I can do or call as, you know, acting as a behavior analyst um, while I, um, because I have that credential. And the fourth edition task list is going to be the document that's going to describe my, my scope of practice. Um, now, if you live in a state that has licensure laws uh, for behavior analysts, uh, that the licensure law is going to be the document that's going to um, supersede your the task list, and that will be your scope of, of practice document. That says this is the things that you know board certified behavior analyst um, yeah. does here. And, and if I could just jump in here real quick, I think there in some states that's causing a little bit of a, uh, some some challenges. I think um, yes. if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if it's still the case or not, but I know in New York State, uh, the yep. the scope of practice by the licensure law was was limited to individuals with autism or developmental disabilities. Uh, and I can't remember the, you know, um, my friends in New York are like, no, you're not describing it right. But, you know, <laughs> to, right. but a, 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 instead of something that could be more broadly applied, you know, as, as you know, we are, you know, the science of of, uh, of, of behavior more generally. Right. No, that's a great way to, to talk about it. And and even if, you know, I know they're trying to do away with that. Um, but I think for historical context, if anything, that's a great example of how a licensure law uh, can, you know, you know, has precedent over, you know, the task list set forth by the BACB and in, in times can severely restrict uh, the scope of practice of the behavior analyst. Okay. And so, um, and so scope of competence is what you're actually competent at, right? Yeah, the things that you're able to do uh, to a certain you know, level of, of fluency or accuracy or however you want to define it. So your, your own individual knowledge, skills, and abilities um, when it comes to um, – uh, you know, whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, and in this case, you know, we're talking about um, – uh, behavior analysis. So you can be competent in things, obviously, that, that are outside of your scope of practice. You know, we talk we jokingly about, you know, playing drums and, and music, you know, um, competent in those, but they're outside of my scope of, of practice. Um, I'm, I'm competent in early intensive behavioral interventions. And that is within my scope of, pra of practice as a as a behavior analyst. So each each individual uh, clinician or, or practitioner has a, a separate um, scope of competence and it's, it's unique. Um, it, everybody is different. Everyone's skill set is different through, through their own training and experiences and supervision and coursework that they've all taken. And so our, our skill sets, our individual skill sets are, 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 are different from one another. I mean, it, it's, an it's, it's kind of like a captain obvious statement, but it is, you know, worth noting as I guess we get into the, the nuances of it. Well, it, it yeah, I, I think the thing that, that is a challenge in this delineation between these two things here is that what determines scope of practice is, I think, is fairly concrete, right? You know, you get the task list, you get licensure laws, or like more concrete than right. not, right. whereas scope of competence, um, I guess, you know, like how, how is that documented? And, you know, some of the, some of the concerns that listeners wrote in on, you know, are like, you know, what... what how do you determine what's, you know, what's my scope of competence? Is it, you know, attending an online CE event? Is it uh, attending a half day workshop? You know, sure. is it uh, an intensive, you know, practicum, you know, under supervision? Um, you know, and, and how is this determined? Is it determined by self-assessment or is it determined by, you know, and, and things like that. So I think that p side of the equation, if you will, is, is far more murkier. Mm hmm. Yeah, and absolutely. And, and to even make it more murky, it's 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 all relative, I think, to the problems that you're that you're facing. You know, there are instances where, um, you know, let's say you have a presenting case of, of severe self injury and you know nothing about it. You've never, you know, conducted a functional analysis of self injury before, let, let alone treated. Uh, case of self-injury. So the level of supervision or undertaking that you're going to have to go through with something like that is is going to be 
would likely be rather time intensive if you, if you decide that that's the route um, that you want to take. Whereas I think um, there might be other things that we, we might want to do. Let's say, for example, I am interested in, in um, using the standard acceleration chart, for example, yet I've had no experience. I'm not trying to undercut the importance or, or um, training that goes into that, but, it, but I would think that it would be less training to be competent in using the chart than it would be to, uh, you know, go through all of the assessment and, and treatment and supervision that would be necessary to treat a severe case of, of, of self-injury. So it's all, it's all relative to the problem. And with all respect to the, to the standard acceleration chart, um, you know, every, every situation is different there. Does that, does that make sense, Matt? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like, you know, I, if I were to kind of interpret what you're saying is that, you know, it's a matter of risk and, and, and you know, that, you know, like, Oh, well, gosh, that could just open a can of worms as I just thought about what just came out of my mouth. But uh, <laughs> so I guess, you know, obviously there's significant likelihood of risk if you mess up a functional analysis and some sort of functional, you know, function based treatment for an individual with severe self injury. And I was going to say there's little risk with the, you know, do you graph it with an equal graph data with an equal interval graph or <laughs> a standard acceleration chart? But, 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 but my, my friends uh, in the standard acceleration charting uh, world would be, uh, would say that there's risk in misinterpreting the data based off of, sure. you know, stretch to fill graphs, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why I, I kind of laughed at myself for, uh, you know, but uh, anyway. Uh, this could go downhill really fast. I, here, don't, so yeah, I, I don't want to tick off the charting people. No, too. no, no. That's the last thing I need. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's funny. Cause I, I, uh, I, um, yeah, I just listened to, I've been talking a lot with, uh, with Rick Cabina and, and some others about, about some of this stuff. So it's kind of fresh on my mind. Sure. Um, and, 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 and it's an, it's an, it's an important issue. Um, but that's an important issue perhaps for another podcast. Um, so, um, but yeah, so I guess trying to dig myself out of the rabbit hole I created here, but you know, so it's a, it's a matter of uh, relative, uh, risk to the, to the client in terms of how much, you know, I mean, you know, one of the things you did the other night when you were presenting to the New Hampshire ABBA folks is you, you know, you put up some funny pictures of your, uh, trials and tribulations with feeding right. with your daughter. And, and you made a nice example of that, you know, of, of, you know, um, as, 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 as uh, some, something that perhaps is a, uh, outside of your scope of competence when, when you, and, and for those who weren't there, Matt put up this picture of his, of his daughter, uh, with, uh, some type of food all over herself in the high chair and the whole nine yards. So, um, yeah, it was pretty funny. It's my uh, failed feeding intervention. That, that's, that's right. That's right. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's funny. My, my youngest is now 10. So it's, it, those days are, are, are pretty far in the rear view mirror to me. So it was, right. I got I got a chuckle I gotta, uh, out of that. And at the same time, I was glad that, uh, we're out of the high chair these days, uh, by, by some, some measure. So one of the things, um, I always think about is, you know, what are, and this is a question that, uh, Sora Stein wrote in, uh, one of the questions, um, and, you know, what, what, what are people doing in other fields in terms of scope of competence versus, uh, you know, scope of practice? Uh, have you, did, have you had a chance to kind of look outside of behavior analysis? Yes, we, we, we have to some degree. And earlier in that paper, we had written about medical specialties and, and credentialing, specialty credentialing, um, in, in medical practice as a sort of framework uh, to propose for behavior analysis. And so, you know, I use for example that, um, and I'm probably butchering this terminology. So the few people who are really in on this stuff, I apologize uh, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm getting it wrong, but you know, you'd say you work for a certain hospital, for example, there, there's certain types of activities or, uh, treatments or, medical, whatever that you're, you've been privileged and been approved of to be able to carry out based, based on your, your, your own demonstrated success in that, in that area. And we've, we made a similar case or we tried to make a similar case for that in behavior analysis. And we finally gave, stopped. I'm not going to say gave up. We stopped and, and I think became the wiser because part of the challenge is at least at this point is that because there's such a demand for services, 
already. And I'm just talking about autism treatment in general here, I guess, because that's, you know, that's the big one. Um, to be able to uh, require that uh, behavior analysts um, demonstrate proficiency in all these areas and, and there's a certain, you know, let's, I don't know, your body that approves their ability to carry out certain types of uh, procedures and strategies, such a process would further um, prohibit or, or, or limit access to services. So something like that right now would not be very uh, useful or effective for the field. And, and, um, and so that point was really, really well taken. And so that, I guess the answer, you know, to circle back, the, that was, you know, the medical area, um, uh, profession was one that we did look at for that, um, but it being much more mature and, and further down the line than, than we as behavior analysts are, um, it might we might have been looking too far uh, into the future. Though I would love for it one day to be the case where you know we act in that way or, or in similar ways or whatever. But I I'm convinced now that we're that would not be a good choice at, the, at this point. What, what paper was that? That was the scope of competence paper. Okay. Um, we had, uh, there was a whole other section that was um, devoted to this specialty credentialing idea. And we tried um, to include it in multiple submissions. And and this is where I talk about my reviewers are very patient with me. Um, the editor is very patient with me. Um, it was just not being fully articulated. And I think the dangers here, Matt, um, of publishing something like that, when it has all those negative outcomes associated with it, um, are, 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 are very real. And so, you know, through those conversations with the reviewers and, and the editor, it became clear to us that, that it just wasn't, um, it wasn't going to fly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it was a learning experience for me. Um, you know, in that process, uh, too. So does that answer, hopefully that answers what you were asking. Well, I think yeah. the general idea is, yeah. you know, what, what are mature professions doing, you know, so-called yeah. mature professions doing uh, about this, uh, medical school is something that did kind of pop to my mind as well. And I can't remember if we dug into this the last time we chatted, but I have a friend of mine, you know, we're not too far from, um, Dartmouth College right. and uh, a buddy of mine who's a doctor and went to you know, Dartmouth Medical School um, and he went through different rotations and things like that and got a lot of experience doing a lot of different things. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure the extent to which um, they measured you know, actual competency and certainly probably didn't in the way in which we would like to, in, in the precise way that we as behavior analysts would like to see it. But, you know, when you think of these different rotations that med students do, you know, I, I wonder once the, the, the market saturates for behavior analysts, is that, is that something that we would envision? You know, I, I often think too that, you know, our, our, as the market does saturate at some point or another, um, is our, you know, training going to become more and more rigorous, you know, um, sure. and, and, and as such, you know, maybe have, you know, less online stuff, more brick and mortar situations where someone can do a rotation in early intensive behavioral intervention, um, working with adults with severe behavior disorders, um, you know, working in schools with kids, you know, who are at risk and with emotional behavioral disorders, uh, et, et cetera. Um, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that looking towards other fields is a good, you know, at least a good way to tr maybe predict about, you know, how things could possibly end up. And then there's there's the whole uniqueness um, aspect of, of what behavior analysis is as, as a science and the, the level of growth that we've experienced, I think, is um, – and I think that Jim's been on your podcast to, to say this. I think he said this before. Is that it's 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 incredible and, and 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 novel to see this this level of growth and booming and, and you know in terms of them you know the BACP you know providing this cr credential and so so there's un some unique a aspects of it um, certainly as well and I I I see you know I see the standards and I see the training. Um, always being improved upon. And, and I think that they've all done a very nice job there uh, being very systematic, very thorough and, and basing it off of, of what's, you know, best practice in, in, 
in credentialing and um, also things that are in the best interest of the field. And so I know that sometimes people have some, um, you know, don't like changes or, or, or um, shifts or, or whatever, but I think all of that is done um, with with really great care and in, in utmost intent to just make sure that consumers of behavior analysis are getting the best stuff that they can. Um, but all that kind of change, you know, has to come very slowly because there's a lot of laws that, that um, uh, I don't know the specifics. And again, I'm sorry for those who do, you know, you, you can't ratchet up your changes so quickly uh, to where, you know, there are people who are trying to obtain these credentials no longer can. And then, and then they're out, you know, the ability to make a living and so forth. And, and so, you know, it has to be oh, yeah, systematic, yeah. you know, oh, of and, course. And that it's, um, and again, it's very, my knowledge level is very superficial. So I'm sorry if I'm screwing it up anybody at the BACB, but much respect yeah, I, I think the term grandfather clause would probably come into a play there, you know, so. Um, Again, for sure. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah you know, I, I think, you know, I got an email from, I think it was from uh, Data, Data Finch uh, today. Uh, they sent out, um, I, I think they're doing some workshops and I, I, I meant to bring it up and I just can't put my thing, I can't pull it up right now, um, but they're doing some workshops uh, or, um, in, and they delineated several different specialties of behavior analysis and they have, you know, Pat Fryman talking about behavioral pediatrics and, you know, uh, all these other people known for their bodies of work in these separate kind of, um, uh, areas of practice. Uh, and that sounds, A, A it sounds pretty cool. And B, it sounds like, you know, it, or it made me think of this whole issue, you know, uh, down the road, are, are, are we going to, you know, are, are those going to become the ro the rotations, you know, the, the you know, uh, in our training systems? Right. Well, I think in like, from my understanding, I know that there's been some very purposeful investments that have been made, um, to create resources about other types of, of applications of behavior analysis, you know, beyond autism. Um, cause I know that there's been a lot of criticism from people that, Hey, you know, we're, we're hyper-focused on this and, and I love, I love all of that. And I'm there and I, and I, and I welcome anybody to, to join in, in this autism train. It's a great place to be. Um, but I also, you know, recognize the value of, the, of professionals in these other areas and things that they can bring. I know that there's a lot of work that's being paid to get that information in a readily accessible format. So if there's policymakers, legislators, you know, whoever who are interested in this stuff applied in other areas that there's stuff for them to consume and access and understand um, and to be able to make informed choices. So I, I believe that that, um, that effort, you know, that that's the sort of vision or at least partial vision from how I understand it behind a lot of that effort. Cool. So I guess it's a, uh... It's probably time to have Jim on an, an, <laughs> again. <laughs> do, please, please do it. And, and I might, you know, I might stand to be corrected on some of the stuff, but, but if anything, I love, I love the last couple of times that he's been on here and um, it's a really great update for me. And I love assigning that stuff to my students because it's, I think it's so important for them to he, uh, hear from him and to hear about uh, credentialing and the BACB, just, just to, to learn about the, um, the workings of, of the uh, credential that they're uh, trying to obtain. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's uh, it's just interesting to hear how how things are decided upon and whatnot, yeah. and you know how 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 certain you know competencies do and don't make the cut and whatnot. I think those have been some of the more interesting tidbits from from that. And not that it's a yeah. secret. It's not it's not a secret. Like when right. Jim goes out and and talks at conferences, he he you know if he yeah you know, he he's he's very open about like how the board works and all that stuff. But uh, it. Um, not everyone gets to see him see him no. talk. So no, and he makes it and he makes it sound interesting. I mean, it really that it is really a trick, isn't be, it? It really could be dry. Oh know? my and gosh! He, he he makes it very. He's very easy to listen to. He makes it very interesting, and and that is very important. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, let's see. Uh, I know this is a question you've gotten. It, it's a question that came up uh, the other night at the New Hampshire ABBA event and, um, Ryan O'Donnell also, uh, wrote in a, the same question. So, uh, well, you know, basically, uh, the, the general question is, you know, why is our field, you know, rely heavily on, you know, just a select number of works, uh, and ethics. Uh, and, and if you'll, 
uh, Ryan, uh, I'll apologize to you if you'll allow me to kind of broaden your question. You know, wh- wh- why do you suppose, uh, and, uh, and it's obviously changing with the work that you're doing and your colleagues are doing, but you know, why do you suppose that the literature on ethics, and again, we could probably throw supervision in there as well, um, uh, is dwarfed by all these other things that, uh, you know, th- th- that are out there in, in our field as we look in our journals and other areas of professional communication? Yeah, I, so, you know, the first one being, you know, why, why was there a limited number of resources being in, in, used in classes? And I think part of that is because, um, you know, a limited number of resources really existed. And, and we had, for example, um, you know, the Bailey and Birch text, which was a really big influence for me, Matt. And, but for, for such a long time, that was, that was really it. And there, you know, that text serves a wonderful purpose where it, it has all the, um, the components of the BACP code and they walk through everything and, and, and talk about each one. And, and as an instructor, that would be, you know, what a go-to resource for me. But unfortunately that, you know, that was the only go-to resource and there weren't really much of other things to, um, to supplement it from. And so I think that that is why, you know, people have, people have asked me like, you know, do you feel, do you feel nervous about, you know, publishing a text on ethics since there, since there's a very dominant, um, you know, use or well-used, uh, text. And, and, um, my thought is, you know, that's a testament to the work that, that John, um, ha- has done and, and, uh, the quality of that work. Um, but I think that the students have, you know, become so focused on that one particular uh, perspective that it might be scary or or um, tough to conceptualize just something that might be different. And, um, you know, I think that uh, by making things, you know, related to practice, I think it allows instructors to incorporate that information and use it in courses versus the the highly, you know, philosophical stuff, which I think is really great and, and helpful for exercises. I think unless it guides the decisions that people are making, um, I don't know how popular, how useful a day-to-day you know, clinicians or people actually doing the work are going to find it. Um, and so, you know, I see that now with the creation of more materials that are really accessible, readily accessible to practitioners, that that stuff is making its way in and supplementing and building upon the really great work that John has done um, to just create more just diversity and thought and opinion. And it just makes everything stronger and elevates everything. Great. Um, all right. So I got a listener from uh, over in Ireland. Uh, uh, Dave writes in, he's a, I'm a BCBA working in Ireland. Uh, I'd be interested to hear his thoughts on Matt's thoughts on the following, um, uh, regarding scope of competence. When I begin a supervisory relationship with a new supervisee, I am explicit in describing my training and experience. I also clearly identify the areas where I have less experience. Would Matt agree with this approach and modeling discussions about scope of competence with respect to this, the area of supervision and, and, deciding whether or not, you know, someone's a fit, if you will, between a, a, a supervisor and a trainee. Right. Yeah. So I think, you know, the, the process that Dave's described is, is certainly one that I have, you know, tried to, to try to undertake. So I think it's a great point, like, um, before you even agree to a supervisory relationship to have that conversation and to make sure that your skill set aligns with the area that the person is going to be practicing and that you also have the skill set of, you know, the supervisory skills to be able to assist somebody in that, um, particular area. I also think it is extremely important to model, um, that we are not, you know, fully capable in all of these areas to model that we have to our, uh, supervisees that we have certain types of strengths and, and admit that we have certain types of weaknesses. So, you know, they come to understand that, it is okay to, to not be good at particular things. And then when you're honest and upfront about it, um, not only does the, um, you know, it allows you to identify the things that you need to work on and be better at, and maybe, you know, assume some extra help and support for, but the client is the one who ultimately benefits from all of that because they're receiving services from somebody who's honest with their own skills and is doing their due diligence to make sure that when they are feeling weak in particular areas that they're going in and in, in doing the things that are necessary. So they're stronger. Awesome. All right. He has a, uh, another question here. Uh, 
kind of a fun one. Um, I've read Matt's comments about avoiding the overuse of PowerPoints when teaching on ethics. <laughs> what are his top tips for ensuring engaging instruction and interaction when teaching ethics, especially with students who are new to the field? Yeah. Great so question. A, nice, nice job, Dave. Thanks. Great question. So yeah, Dave, Dave might've seen from Twitter that I don't like to teach with PowerPoint presentations. I used a PowerPoint the other day in class for like the first time in three years. And it felt really awkward. The, um, what do you, I, what do, you do instead? I'm sorry, but I'm just... yeah, no, no, it's good. I, I, um, you know, I'll outline in my mind or write, you know, write an outline down and bring it, but I, I'll, I'll, you just hold the discussion and, and, and um, use the whiteboard or in actually one of the classes right now, we actually have a blackboard. So it's, it's a fun blast of the past. I get to use chalk and erasers again. Um, but I, but I, I roll it, you know, being discussion based and we do a lot of uh, group work and we dig into articles and, you know, analyze graphs and, you know, all, all that fun stuff. But it just, bored the heck out of me creating, um, talking off of PowerPoints. And I felt like it wasn't a good productive use of time as a faculty to be developing these PowerPoint presentations. And so I, I just felt like a lot more fluent and comfortable with the material just by holding discussions and talking about it in that way. So, um, I promise you it, it it's trying to make it fun and engaging. Um, I don't just like sit and like read out of the book. That's certainly not it, but you know, I think for example, um, not to digress too much, but I took a, a research methods actually in my master's program with Al Poling, and I never once saw Al um, even bring any materials to class. He'd just come and, you know, we're talking about multiple baselines today. He'd come and, and bestow his wisdom, and, and he was just so fluent. Wow. <laughs> and it was so remarkable. It was so engaging. And, and if you've ever heard him talk, I think he does the same thing. I've never seen him use a PowerPoint presentation at a conference either, but just really, really good and knowledgeable about that. And I think, I think the students can really appreciate that if it's done well. So I see. I see. Well, to, to age myself, when I was a teaching assistant in graduate school, we used the overhead transparencies. Oh, yes. <laughs> so it was, it was very old school. Uh, and uh, so PowerPoint was used sparingly. PowerPoint was in existence back then. I will say that. Um, sure, but we, we, uh, yeah, <laughs> no, I promise. No, but we, we, used, we used whiteboards, uh, uh, but we would, we would throw, you know, for showing data, we would use a, an overhead, you know, get the transparencies made. At, and uh, yeah, sure. it, was, it was great. So uh, I might have to put, I might have to go to Google images and put, you know, and search overhead transparency and put that in the uh, overhead projector and put that in the show notes. You know? Please, please do. I mean, if that's the image for this, for this podcast episode, oh, yeah. I would be so happy. <laughs> That would, that would be great. That would yeah. be great. So here's a rather archaic conversation. Oh right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, well, we made it uh, through just about an hour of discussion with no sidebars into uh, you know some of the other topics that could have possibly come up, like uh, uh, drumming or uh, skiing <laughs> or college basketball or anything like that. So I think we we stuck stuck to the uh, to the to the agenda pretty well here. So, um, all right, Matt, it's uh, it's always fun chatting with you. And uh, folks, by the way, uh, follow Matt on Twitter. He's, he's, uh, it's a it's a mix of dissemination of the work that he's doing plus some some occasional fun commentary that's a little bit off topic but uh i always find fairly interesting uh and, and, not, and not so off topic to be distracting it's it's a I, I think it's a really nice balance so uh matt what's your what's your twitter handle yeah it's just um at matt broadhead so m-a-t-t-b-r-o-d-h-e-a-d -T -T -E so there'd only be um one A in my last name. And then if you visit also to, to plug the website, mattbroadhead.com, M-A-T-T-B-R-O-D-H-E-A-D.com. Um, I've got a lot of information there. Um, I, I try to publish all, put all my, my articles on there that are accessible. And I also have a 30% off coupon for, for the book. If you buy it from the publisher, I'm directly on that website too. So check it out. Very cool. And lastly, um, any, conferences that you're speaking at coming up in the near future? So I am 
on a conference break because uh, there's uh, my wife and I are pregnant um, again here, and we expect another baby in, in April, which is very exciting. And so I am um, just I am going to decline um, invitations up until about um, gosh into next fall, where. I'm actually going to be going to the autism conference, or not the autism conference, but the ABAI conference in um, Sweden. Oh, cool. Right? And so we're actually going to be taking our, our young infant there um, with us because they travel for free if they're under two. So that'll be, that'll be exciting. I will be at ABBA too. Um, oh, great, so great. it'll be ABBA and then um, the international conference, uh, which I'm really excited about. I've never been to Sweden before. My wife and I are really excited to, to check that out. And, um, but I, I love go I love doing, uh, if I can't make it face to face, you know, the, the internet is so accessible, it makes everything so accessible. So, you know, like I did with the New Hampshire, Hampshire Abba to, um, you know, do webinars and things like that. I really, really enjoy talking to the groups that way too. So if I can't make it physically, that's a good way to do it. All right, cool. And so that website, which will be in the show notes of this episode, uh, will have all the ways of getting a hold of you as well. So if people yep. are interested in that, they can uh, they can reach out and make that connection. So, all right, Matt. Well, this has been uh, yet another fun conversation. Thanks for coming back and uh, talking uh, talking ethics, scope of practice, et cetera. So. Thanks, Thanks for lot. having me, Matt. I appreciate it. It's great, great podcast. What you're doing is, is fantastic for the field. So really an honor to be here again. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.